Welcome to Back to Health, your source for the latest in health, wellness, and medical care, keeping you informed so you can make informed healthcare choices for yourself and your whole family. Back to Health features conversations about trending health topics and medical breakthroughs from our team of world-renowned physicians at Weill Cornell Medicine. I'm Melanie Cole, and joining me today is Dr. Suzanne Pastori. She's an assistant attending obstetrician gynecologist at New York Presbyterian Hospital Weill Cornell Medical Center, and she's an assistant professor of clinical obstetrics and gynecology at Weill Cornell Medical College, Cornell University. And she is here today to talk to us about human papillomavirus, HPV, helping patients understand this sexually transmitted infection. Dr. Pastori, thank you so much for joining us today. You know, this HPV has been all over the news for years now with the vaccine and questions about it. So I'd like you to jump right in with what it is. What is HPV? How common is this infection? Sure. First, I'd like to say thank you for having me, Melanie. HPV is a topic that needs discussion. So I'm happy to be doing this podcast for you and for our patients. So HPV is human papillomavirus, and it is very common. In fact, it is the most common sexually transmitted infection in the United States. And 80% of sexually active women will have HPV at some point in their lives. Thankfully, most women clear it before it can cause cancer. Wow. That's really common. Those are some astounding statistics. So you mentioned cancer. What kind of problems or cancer can the HPV infection cause? So in women, HPV causes genital warts, which are benign growths, most commonly on the vulva, but it is also associated with certain cancers and precancerous lesions. Virtually all cervical cancer is caused by HPV. And HPV can also cause vulvar, vaginal, anal, and oral pharyngeal cancers in women. Wow. So how do people get this infection? How is it transmitted, Dr. Pastori? HPV is transmitted by skin-to-skin contact, also vaginal, anal, or oral sex. And typically, it has no symptoms. That's why we do pap and HPV tests to screen for precancerous changes on the cervix before it ever gets to cancer. Dr. Pastori, if a woman is engaging in sexual activity or men, would they see those warts? Would they see it and know and say, oh, yikes? Or is it something that doesn't really show itself? Genital warts can be seen on the vulva, but Usually, we don't see warts on the cervix. Sometimes you can see it. But a majority of the time, HPV is just picked up on the pap smear in routine screening. So if a woman is engaged in sexual intercourse with a man, would she see it on his penis? Not always. Some men can have genital warts, but the majority of men are transmitting HPV to a female unknowingly. There's no FDA-approved test in men, so they're not being screened. That's so interesting that men aren't being screened. And before we discuss the vaccine, are there treatments for existing HPV? So if a woman tests positive for this at her gynecologist, what then? Hmm, This is a good question. (laughs) Unfortunately, there is no treatment for HPV itself. So most women with a competent immune system will clear the virus in 12 to 18 months. However, a certain percentage can have a latent infection that can show up again later in life. There are no oral medications to treat the virus. So genital warts can be treated with topical medications or cryotherapy, which is freezing, or they can be removed surgically. Cervical dysplasia, which is a precancerous condition of the cervix, is treated surgically as well. Do condoms work to protect from HPV? Unfortunately, they're not fully protective because it can be transmitted skin to skin. It may decrease transmission, but it does not eliminate the possibility of getting HPV. 
which is why we are here now to discuss this vaccination, which is really a game changer in this world of cervical cancer and HPV transmission. So I'd like you to tell us, Dr. Pastori, about Gardasil. When was this developed? What do we know about the efficacy of it? Gardasil was initially approved in 2006. The initial Gardasil vaccine was a quadrivalent vaccine, meaning it covered four strains of the virus. The two most common that cause cervical cancer, which are 16 and 18, and the two most common that cause genital warts, which are 6 and 11. In 2014, the FDA approved Gardasil 9, which covers nine strains of the virus, the two most common strains that cause genital warts, and seven other strains which can cause cervical, vulvar, vaginal, anal, oropharyngeal, and other head and neck cancers. As for efficacy, it is 99% effective when administered to women before HPV exposure. So that's why we need to be vaccinating our children. That's incredible. What do we know about the safety of the vaccine? You know, people have so many questions about vaccines today, and I trust the experts and people really that are much smarter than I came up with this. Tell us a little bit about the safety. The HPV vaccine is safe. It's not a live virus. All HPV vaccines use virus-like particles, which like mimic the viral capsid and don't contain any genetic material. Millions of people around the world have gotten the HPV vaccine without serious side effects. I'd say the most common side effects are like any vaccine, soreness or redness at the injection site. In adolescence, there's a small risk of fainting. <laughs> so we usually observe them for 15 minutes after administration to make sure there's not any problems. Well, then who does need to be vaccinated? You mentioned briefly that women need to be vaccinated before they become sexually active or before they acquire the HPV virus. Tell us a little bit about the age, when should kids get vaccinated, and the rationale, again, for starting that early. Traditionally, the HPV vaccine was recommended for women age 9 through 26. Then it was approved for boys. And now the HPV vaccine is approved for women and men age 9 to 45. So the target age is age 11 to 12 to vaccinate children prior to exposure, so prior to sexual contact, basically. But you can give it later to try to play catch up. Okay, so this is both boys and girls now at this age, and why are two doses recommended for 9 to 14-year-olds while an older adolescent needs three doses? Do they have the rationale for that? Yes. So when you're younger, you have a more robust immune response. So the immune response in this age range provides antibody levels that are equivalent to or greater than those who receive three doses at the age of 15 and older. So another reason to vaccinate early, two shots and instead of three. Absolutely. Makes a lot of sense. Now, do women who've been vaccinated still need to have a pap smear? Because now this is really, as I said at the beginning, a game changer for cervical cancer. But now it's also changing recommendations from ACOG and such for pap smear recommendations. I know that mine are fewer and further between than they used to be. And so as far as screening for cervical cancer and Dr. Pastori, while you're telling us about this, one thing that we should note is that the pap smear was actually developed at Weill Cornell University. That's true. So Dr. Papanicolaou, by inventing the pap smear, decreased cervical cancer deaths worldwide. Vaccination status has not changed the pap screening guidelines. It may someday, but it has not yet. They are age-based, and the PAP screening guidelines keep changing, <laughs> I feel like, every few years. Although Gardasil covers nine strains of the HPV virus, there are other strains that can still cause cervical cancer. And in women in this older age range, age 30 to 65, most gynecologists do co-testing, which is PAP testing plus the HPV test. The other options are to do PAP alone every three years, 
or HPV testing alone every five years. But the new PAP guidelines, most of us are doing co-testing, which is looking for the HPV, high-risk HPV strains, plus cytology every five years because it's the best detection. That's what I get. I got that co-testing just a couple of years ago. So now I wait another year or something to get my pap smear. So it can be a little confusing. And thank you so much for clearing that up. Now, what should young men or women do if they didn't receive the vaccination or if they didn't finish their series? So are they considered not protected? Can they finish it? Up to what age can you get vaccinated? Obviously, they should see their healthcare provider and get vaccinated. If they didn't finish the series, they can complete it. They don't need to restart it. In the United States, we're not doing a great job of vaccinating against HPV, unfortunately. The vaccination rate is around 50% among women. So we need to do a better job. We certainly do. Now, pediatricians are talking to their patients every day about this. And I know that you are an obstetrician gynecologist, but for the pediatricians that are looking at these kids and saying to the parents, to their 11 and 12 year old kids, and even younger, this is the vaccine I want to give. They're getting a lot of questions from parents. How can they help parents and explain the importance of this vaccine to their patients? Tell us a little bit about that conversation. Okay. So pediatricians, are used to giving vaccines to prevent disease. So they are very good at having these conversations. They need to explain that HPV is a serious disease and it is important to protect your children from HPV before they are at risk of exposure. The HPV vaccine reduces the risk of genital warts and cancer up to 99%. I think I said that before. I'm just emphasizing it. (laughs) No, it's good to emphasize it. We need to reinforce these things. And now my last question to you, and I'd like you to offer your best advice, but as parents are explaining this vaccine to their children, again, this is something that's been a little controversial because some parents think that it's going to give their kids this, you know, way forward. But speak to parents now, Dr. Pastore. What would you like them to know about the importance of this vaccine, discussing it with their children and and discussing any questions that they have with their family physician? I would say to the parents, I would start the conversation in this way. We are so lucky in this country to have access to a vaccine that can help prevent cancer. This vaccine is proven to be safe and effective but it needs to be given before exposure. So not all children are going to be forthcoming (laughs) with their parents as to when they're becoming sexually active. It's the most effective way to protect your child from getting the disease, but also prevent them from spreading it to others. That's so important. And it's actually a vaccine that can prevent cancer. That's what really amazes me about this. And Dr. Pastore, thank you so much for joining us today and telling us about this. It was really an important episode and so informative. And while Cornell Medicine continues to see our patients in person, as well as through video visits, and you can be confident of the safety of your appointments at Wild Cornell Medicine. That concludes today's episode of Back to Health. We'd like to invite our audience to download, subscribe, rate, and review Back to Health on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. And for more health tips, go to wildcornell.org and search podcasts. And parents, don't forget to check out Kids HealthCast. So many great interviews there. I'm Melanie Cole. Thanks so much for joining us today. Every parent wants what's best for their children. But in the age of the internet, it can be difficult to navigate what is actually fact-based or pure speculation. Cut through the noise with Kids HealthCast, featuring Wild Cornell Medicine's expert physicians and researchers, discussing a wide range of health topics, providing information on the latest medical science. Finally, a podcast to help you make informed choices for your family's health and wellness. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Also, don't forget to rate us five stars.
All information contained in this podcast is intended for informational and educational purposes. The information is not intended nor suited to be a replacement or substitute for professional medical treatment or for professional medical advice relative to a specific medical question or condition. We urge you to always seek the advice of your physician or medical professional with respect to your medical condition or questions. While Cornell Medicine makes no warranty, guarantee, or representation as to the accuracy or sufficiency of the information featured in this podcast, and any reliance on such information is done at your own risk. Participants may have consulting, equity, board membership, or other relationships with pharmaceutical, biotech, or device companies unrelated to their role in this podcast. No payments have been made by any company to endorse any treatments, devices, or procedures. And while Cornell Medicine does not endorse, approve, or recommend any product, service, or entity mentioned in this podcast, opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the speaker and do not represent the perspectives of Wild Cornell Medicine as an institution.